All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome in. We're so excited to have you today. Um, as we get people joining us, we'd love to have you type in the chat um, where you're from today and what department your media planning course is in. Um, so let's see. I'll keep talking, but if you can't hear me, I know I see one thing in there saying they can't hear, but it looks like somebody else can. So we'll hope that you guys can all hear me. We'd love to, like I said, get you into our chat. Thank you, Courtney. Awesome. Now we hear from a lot of people that their media planning course is either in communications or in marketing. So we'd like to know where your school has it. Um, and as people are chatting in, I'd love to direct your attention to um, we have a pop-up that will show up in a second for ProfCon. ProfCon is our um, big annual event here at Stu Kent. This will be our fourth one that we'll be hosting. Um, we're going to have three days of sessions from top educators, industry experts on top trends and engagement tips for your classroom. This event is a free virtual event where there will be plenty of opportunities to engage with giveaways. You can click on that pop-up to learn more about the speakers and register for the event. Um, this will be from June 15th to 17th. Awesome. Um, we'll leave that up for a little bit, especially as people are hopping in. I like to see all these different colleges of where your media planning class is. I feel like there's a lot of the communication department, which is, I guess, what I expected, but I do see a journalism school and I guess journalism and mass communication. So awesome. All right, so we'll get a bit started into our event today. Um, today we have three amazing speakers for you. We'll first hear from Media Planning Essentials author, Beth Donnelly Egan on her brand new courseware updates. We will then hear from Dana Boren teaching traditional, on teaching traditional radio versus streaming radio. And lastly, we'll hear from Nancy Brinson on how to craft a final project for your courses. At any point during these presentations, you can use the chat feature that you're already getting familiar with um, to ask any questions. And we have our team that will be holding on to those questions for a Q&A session after each speaker. Um, and then just to get this out of the way, we will be sending out a recording of this presentation, as well as we have lots of handouts for you today of cool assignments that you can get added into your upcoming semesters, whether it's a summer course or a fall one. Um, we're going to have lots of great things for you today. All right. Without further ado, I'm going to invite State uh, Beth onto the stage, and we're going to get started. So let's do this. All right. Um, as she's getting on here, I'm going to start introducing Beth. Um, Beth is an associate professor of advertising at Syracuse University in the Newhouse School of Public Communication. As a 25-year veteran of the advertising media industry, Beth has led the strategic media planning for Coca-Cola, AT&T, Kraft and Nabisco, and L'Oreal Paris. She is now, or she now leads the media planning curriculum for the advertising department at Syracuse University and teaches advertising strategy. Beth is a great asset to our Stukent team and a dedicated author, and we're excited to have her speak on her updates today. So I'll leave it to Beth now. Thank you very much, Darlin. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm happy to be joined by Trisha and Nancy. Um, I'm very interested in your um, presentations as well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, hopefully. Okay, there we go. And if somebody could audibly tell me if they can see this, please. Can everybody see it? Yeah. Great. Um. All right, so I'm here today to talk about how to elevate your media planning course. Uh, I'm 
sure some of you on this call have used um, the book in the past. Um, if you're new to Media Planning Essentials, I'll sort of take you through um, some of the changes um, that we've been working on. Um, so quickly, uh, I want to start with what the imperative is from an industry standpoint, um, why this book needed to evolve, um, how Media Planning Essentials is going to meet the, the imperative, uh, I'm sure most of you by now already know that we're sunsetting the um, partnership with Nielsen and their Comps Point Influence tool. And we've been working, uh, gosh, darling, I feel like it's been a year and a half, a very long time, on um, pulling together simulation model, um, Mimic Pro media planning. I'm really excited to share some of that with you today. Um, and then I'll kind of wrap up a little how I envision um, media planning essentials being uh, able to be evolved into the classroom, um, and I'll leave you with three key takeaways. Um, I have time for questions and discussion um, at the end, uh, but I will also take a couple breaks throughout um, to answer any questions along the way. So feel free to type them in the chat. So first of all, why are we here and, and why um, does anything need to change? You know, over the past 20, 25 years, um, the focus has been on the emergence of the internet um, and digital media and how that has evolved. And the industry has just been so focused on digital, digital, digital. And you know, in the beginning, digital only agencies arose. Um, we've gone through the change of programmatic buying. We're entering the phase of addressability and Web 3.0. And I think that really brings us to a place where we need to stop talking about digital as something separate and distinct in um, what we're doing in our advertising campaign. Because the reality today is that everything is digital. Um, it was like that when I think it's more so true today now than ever. I talk, I've talked in the book in the past um, about Marshall McLuhan's um, The Medium is the Message. You know, and that's a very um, old, uh, well-established and easy theory to fall back on. Um, but what, what fascinates me about um, The Medium being the message in 2022 is how this theory that was developed um, pretty much at the same time that the internet was just being conceived. No one even knew what was happening over um, in ARPANET. Um, just as this was being conceived, the environment that Marshall McLuhan was talking about when he made statements like the way that we receive information is more important than the message itself, we were talking about some very rudimentary aspects of it. Um, when McLuhan was thinking about television, you know, if you've read Tim Wu's The Attention Economy, you know, he talks about the fact that, you know, TV brought more than just sight, sound, and motion um, to the media industry. It brought shared experiences, which is really, really critical in terms of how um, people uh, interact with our brands. If you go out um, running in a Nike t-shirt, you know what that mean, what that stands for, and you know that everybody around you knows what that stands for. Um, when we talk, used to talk about the medium as the message in the context of print, we were talking about that ability to have that tactile experience um, with the magazine. You know, the fact that that our moms were actually touching our ad as she was turning the pages, um, we felt was uh, really critical. And it was, but I don't think even McLuhan could have realized, um, you know, the importance of each medium being independent of the content that it's mediating, um, independent of what's going out over that channel, um, has its own intrinsic effects, which are unique to its message. Um, that statement for me resonates so much more when I'm thinking about um, TikTok versus Snapchat or Facebook feed versus uh, a pre-roll on CNN. Um, it really has such a, a bigger impact. And as all of this was evolving, uh, what those in the industry realized fairly quickly is from a media planning perspective, we have to stop planning against the media channels. 
Um, it's less relevant whether we're talking about television or radio or print or newspaper. What's important now is the format. Am I planning, am I looking at how to reach and engage consumers in a video format? Or am I thinking about how do I engage with them in some sort of audio format? Um, that will be very, very different, um, distinct and unique. We started thinking about um, when I started in the industry, when we were looking at where are we going to place our message that was all about the consumer media habits. Where is the attention going? Where are the eyeballs gazing? Um, if I can just find a way um, or find the right place, I should say, um, to put my message because I know mom's reading magazines or I know my sports fans watching NFL football. Um, that's where I would place my message, kind of irrelevant of what the person was doing there. Um, media habits are no longer um, the, the way to find and earn attention from our consumers. It's all about the consumer behavior. And we have so much more information now to understand, not just what, where a person is giving their attention, where a, pers a person is spending time with the media, but we have clues and hints to why they're there. And we need to use those signals, those indicators to help understand, hey, wait a second, is this a moment where I have permission to be a part of that conversation? Uh, the way I talk about it uh, with my students is, you know, we've all been in those awkward situations um, at parties or dances or what have you, where you're having a conversation with folks and somebody walks up and just says something out of the blue. And the whole crowd is just sort of wondering, how do I react to this? Because this just isn't within the right context of what we're talking about here. Um, and that's what advertisers are up against now. Um, with consumers' ability to control what messages they receive, uh, advertisers are left to really make sure that they understand the context of where the consumer is, why they're there, and understand whether or not they have permission to enter the conversation at that point. So that's what really led me to um, take a, a fresh look uh, at how media planning uh, essentials was structured. I mean, I will, I will tell you when I was writing it back in 2015, um, I wasn't thrilled with the offline online media structure um, that has existed in the book today. Uh, but at that point, I, I didn't really know how to do it differently. And, and digital, while a large and growing part of the industry, uh, still sat a little separately uh, from how TV and radio were bought and sold. But that's not true anymore. Um, if I'm going to place a television schedule with NBC Universal, for example, I'm going to be talking to them about all of their assets. So let me quickly introduce um, how I tried to um, shift that in the context of the book. So I've completely revised uh, the table of context, I'll contents. I'll take you quickly through this um, and then I'll pause uh, for any questions. The first couple chapters aren't um, significantly different. I talk a little bit about the art and science of media planning just to get uh, students who probably have never even heard of this um, industry before to understand a little bit what it's about. Talk about communications planning. Um, in the old version, this was very much structured around comms point. Um, in this chapter, it takes a little bit of a broader point of view. Um, and then I've made a shift into once I've set up the idea that media or communications planning is, you know, that pursuit of finding the right person at the in the right place at the right time. Uh, I kind of structure uh, the next segment of the textbook uh, in that fashion. So in terms of finding the right people, that's where all of the content around understanding the target audience, demographics, psychographics how we talk about them, how we build these personas sits. In finding the right place, I introduce uh, how all of the concepts around quantifying the audience. So that gets to you know, that heavier media math piece. Uh, the students learn about Nielsen, MRI Simmons, all the different ways um, that we seek to um, segment audiences. 
And then finally, on discovering the right time, that's all about the channel uh, selection. Um, I get into some of the media theories in this chapter uh, and get into the uh, concepts around, you know, uh, ad avoidant behavior and how uh, advertisers can help um, help correct for that. Um, as before I go on, as I um, should probably say, is I, I really strove to strike a balance between um, structuring this in the best way for 2022 and beyond, but also not changing the content too much. So if you have been using the text, um, there will be a lot of fam familiar content um, still in there. Um, one of my favorite channels, media's role in the marketing mix. Um, I think media planners are the strongest when they understand their role overall and can go to a client and talk to a client um, about the completeness of the decision journey and how the media plan meets that. Uh, one change we've made is uh, we've moved up the measurement chapter. That was um, another uh, sticking point for me. I didn't love that it was at the end of the book um, before because measuring what works really needs to be established before we even figure out what um, we're going to do. So that chapter has been moved up. And like I said earlier, um, I've done away with that online offline, you know, sort of binary uh, approach to this uh, and really broken it out by format. Um, so chapter eight is sort of a level set chapter uh, about how we use, you know, what data we have, how do we collect it, and then how can we use that to create a data-driven strategy. Um, this then gives them sort of all the basics they know, they need to know. So as I go into social media, video, search and display, streaming and podcast, streaming audio and podcasting, and mobile, uh, I don't have to, uh, they already understand sort of the basics of what programmatic is and real-time bidding, et cetera. So I could talk about specifically about each of these um, different formats. Uh, the other thing that I will say is um, the order of these chapters, uh, while it is purposeful, um, there is a lot of debate on, on what went where and which chapter, what order they should go in. Um, so I tried very hard to write it in a way that if you want to teach them in different ways, um, if you think video should go first or um, search should go first, by all means, um, you should be able to easily do that um, and not confuse the students too much. Um, another change, uh, I should say, hopefully an enhancement that I made is, you know, teaching integrated communications, as some of you indicated in the chat, that's a full time, that's a whole course. Um, so we're not going to be able to teach that here. So I took a case study um, approach here, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit later. And then um, finally, in 2022, you really can't um, end any conversation about media without addressing the, ADA, the um, issues of data, privacy, um, and regulation and ethics. So I will pause here, as promised, before I go on. Any questions yet? Great. Um, so I'm looking at this as really a, cust a customer consumer centric approach. Um, how do we start this process um, thinking about the consumer? And this is a, a slight point of difference, um, I believe, in, in some of the other uh, tools you have to teach media planning. Um, not that they don't take a consumer centric approach, uh, but this whole uh, course is coming from a place of we've got to think digitally first and that starts with not just understanding who the consumer is but understanding their behavior through all the signals that we receive. Like I said, I moved measurement at first. No reason for a penguin holding a rule other than I like penguins. Um, but the importance of making sure that the objectives and the KPIs are set at the outset so you understand how you're going to achieve success. And then, like I said before, breaking it out into those um, various formats. So I talk about text separately, um, then image and video um, type formats, and a whole chapter of audio um, completely out on its own. 
And as I referenced before, uh, took a case study approach with the um, with the integrated communications chapter. Um, all of these cases were pulled from WARC. So if your university does have access to the WARC database, you can go in and get this full case study out of there um, and, and assign that to your students. Um, knowing that not everybody has that um, kind of access, I have also provided um, various well, the, the chapter goes through the case, all of the uh, nuts and bolts that the student needs to know about um, the case, but also provided links to other outside resources. Um, so you can really dig in and have a conversation about why those tactics were right for the strategy and the insight that was set up um, initially. The idea here is to really inspire the students um, as um, they go off as they're creating uh, maybe plans for some outside assignments. And then final, finally, um, a chapter on um, the digital ethics privacy landscape. Um, it takes a very broad overview of what are the issues that we're talking about um, and then helps to address sort of how should the students be thinking through these problems um, because certainly by the by the time they get through this course and through their college career and start working in the advertising industry, everything, all of the details that they've learned here will most certainly have changed. Darlin, I'll stop again in case there's any questions. I'm seeing some people who love the new um design of the book and the flow. So I think we're off to some great comments. So keep Excellent. going. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Um, so as I said, uh, we have um, been making the shift from comps point um, to our, our own simulation model. Um, before I dive too much into that, just sort of wanted to take a look at uh, Comps Point was sort of my inspiration um, for writing this book, so it's near and dear to me. Um, but there were issues with Comps Point, um, as we've all felt. Uh, difficult to install, being uh, Windows only based. Uh, it ended at that channel planning optimization um, phase, um, and it was very open ended. It, it really um, kind of created maybe too many, you know, the paradox of choice for students, too many choices. Um, and I think sometimes they struggled with exactly where to go. Um, we are leading and leave, losing an industry leading tool. Um, it did give students sort of this day one creden credential um, to walk into. Um, and what was in there, I mean, we were getting the version that the industry was using. So um, the benefit of all of that uh, real world research, as well as um, some costs embedded into it. However, I think there are a lot of um, overwhelming advantages of, of what we've developed. And I'm really excited um, if you haven't gone through it yet um, to be able to um, take a look at it. Uh, one of the biggest advantages is it extends into execution. Um, so once the channel allocation has been created, the students do have to go in and make some buying choices uh, and get that feedback from those choices. How did it really impact the KPIs that were established at the outset? Um, it provides students with feedback um, throughout on the inputs. You know, with comms point, it was just sort of like, is it good enough? I don't know, we don't get to execute. Here, the students will actually have the opportunity um, to make those real world choices and then um, learn, as any of us who have practiced in the business quite quickly, whether our um, ideas were, our decisions were the right ones or not. Um, the other thing I really like about it is it really is a much more directed learning approach. So there, there are um, better and worse answers. Um, let me just see what this next slide is. Um, so while they, so they'll have the opportunity to analyze a, a cross tab report and come up with a, a target audience persona, much like they did in comms point. Um, but 
there will be feedback saying, hey, based on that cross point, cross, cross tab, um, that was not the best. Uh, those were not the best decisions. This is really um, what your target audience should look like. Um, they still delve into the message and strategy drivers. Um, but again, they'll be given an attitude and usage survey um, from the brand to help them kind of decide uh, what's the right message, what's the right strategy driver. Uh, and again, they get feedback saying, mm, you didn't quite make the cut. Uh, and that goes on um, throughout. So I think that more directed learning experience will be really beneficial um, for the students to see some sort of real time feedback. Uh, there are a lot of other elements um, built into the to SIM, uh, which I think are really exciting. Um, one aspect of it is there are little questions along the way that sort of help to check students' knowledge as they go through. Um, they get the opportunity to sort of help a buddy um, they, rather than just focusing on that single, single uh, target audience we've created for the, the model exercise. Uh, they kind of get to do in a little aside with a colleague um, and get to experience the some of the decisions in, uh, in another um, with another brand. So it expands their learning on that. So you've decided to adopt media planning essentials. Um, you've decided to utilize the sim. Um, the other thing I, I should say about the SIM, um, I don't think I put this on the slide, uh, you know, the, the pacing, there'll be a suggested pacing um, through the lesson plans, but the pacing is really up to you. Um, I know a lot of you, as do I, um, have outside relationships with real world clients that we like um, to bring our students into. Um, so I think you'll have the opportunity um, for that. So the SIM is purpose built to complement the text. Um, so we really worked to um, kind of pace it. So as they're learning the concepts um, in the online content, um, they can follow along within the SIM. Um, if you do have that real live um, client that you really want your students to go out and create that plan for, I would say the SIM is a great primer for them. Um, so if it works for you, um, try to get through the model in the first half of the class, and then you've got the rest of the semester um, to have them go off and work with your client. As I mentioned, um, when you get into that format, the chapters should be able to be taught in any order. There might be a couple of small cross references that you might need to highlight, um, but feel free to kind of lay that out that in a manner that works for you. Um, a little bit different from before, um, there are still a lot of links um, in the text as, as I had previously. Um, I have made those an integral part of the learning objectives. Um, that will be reinforced through the lecture slides um, that you get, but also through the quizzes. So if there's an important link in that chapter that I want the students to um, pay extra attention to, I've made sure to put a question in the quiz that forces them to go look at that. So um, feel free to make um, better use of that. And um, I'm working on new and improved media math exercises um, that will just sort of elevate the experience a little and hopefully be, um, oh, what's the website I just learned about? We're all, oh, hopefully Quizlet um, safe. We'll see how that works, but that's the goal. So the three key, key takeaways really just, you know, don't have to tell anybody the industry is more complex and challenging than ever. And I don't believe anyone else has the ability right now to address the complexity um, with these ongoing current updates that we're able to do um, with Stu Kent. So as has always been the case, the spending numbers are always the latest spending numbers. Um, so we've got Zenith's 2021 um, spending uh, wrap, wrap up. Um, all the ad formats are continually updated and, and continually changing. Um, there are a lot of big announcements at the upfronts this year. Don't know that I'll get all those um, in this version, um, but knowing that the students um, are not reading about an ad format that was introduced um, two years ago. 
Um, just like the creative side of advertising, learning by doing is the best way. And so the simulation model uh, really gives them the opportunity to do that. Um, and as always, my goal has always to bet to write something to the students in that very conversational and interactive tone um, to, to make the content more interesting, more accessible, um, and hopefully uh, to be more interesting um, to enhance the ultimate learning outcomes. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen, hopefully. If I can figure that out. Are we good? Yeah, good. Thank you, Beth. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, got a question on the SIM from, um, let's see, how much of SIM detail slash case will be updated each semester? Oh, okay. Um, to prevent share or people sharing the right answers among students. So like, have you done anything with your um, courseware to try to help that cheating in the classroom? Um, I know that's a big thing for education is trying to get people not to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and so darling, you can keep me a little honest here. Um, but within the quizzes um, per se, um, I would say 95% of the questions are brand new questions, um, mm -hmm. partly driven by the content, um, but also partly driven by um, Quizlet. Um, I kept a couple in there because I felt like if you really wanted to go to that much trouble to find the two or three answers that you could get off Quizlet, uh, knock yourself out. Um, we're also creating more of a test bank. Um, so not all students will see the same questions. Um, and Darlin, I believe not all the answers are in the same order either, correct? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I show hope it's for students. I hope not, because I put the right answer in the first one. <laughs> on the, <laughs> so that would be a, an easy um, assumption. Um, so that's what we're doing in terms of the quizzes. Um, in terms of the sim, um, there's really not much, well, I take that back. Uh, they could probably copy it. I, I believe the sim gets updated once a year. Is that correct, Darla? Um, yes, yeah, so we have a team that works on renovating simulations. And so as part of that is to try to combat people who may be um, finding answers online. Um, and so I know with some of our other simulations, we will change up things. So that way, if they did find that golden ticket opportunity throughout the simulation that they're not going to succeed the same way each time, or if they share it with other students that they won't be the same experience. But part of the simulations is having um, this algorithm that helps already combat some of that cheating that like, depending on how they go about allocating certain things, um, it can be a bit different, like there'll be some variance there. But with a simulation, definitely, there'll be some um, renovations that happen in the future that will help with this exact issue. But yeah, awesome. I think that's great. We had some conversation in the chat um, about creating a digital first um, program at colleges. I know two people were talking about creating those at their colleges, and I thought, Beth, maybe you could speak a little bit to that. Um, any recommendations, any lessons that you may have learned from <laughs> creating a digital first um, courseware, but also probably you've implemented that into your um, department as well. Yeah, a couple things I would say to that. Um, I mean, I think, first of all, just making them uh, data literate at the outset is really important. And that's why that data driven strategies chapter is, um, is early on. Um, understanding like I said, what, what's being collected, how it's being collected, and how it's being used. Um, so at the outset, the students can, can kind of understand. I think social media is a good example because they all think they know it so well. Um, you know, so they think that if they get a funny, creative idea and put it on TikTok, then it's going to go viral and their brand is going to meet its objectives. Um, that comes through their own experience of using TikTok. The reality is you start by observing 
what your consumers are doing. I'll just stay with TikTok as, as an example because it's there are already a number of great case studies around this. Um, understanding how consumers are interacting, your consumers are interacting, period, how they're interacting with the category on TikTok and how they're interacting with your brand or your competitors on TikTok um, helps to then piece together for you uh, what is the right strategy. So there, there's actually a, a case study in chapter 14 um, where uh, it's a Vans case study uh, where they actually took an influencer marketing campaign idea but then used it to identify what types of people were following that um, that uh, influencer to then inform how they were going to define their um, segment audience. So I, I would, and that's why I had that sort of consumer first slide. So I, I would start with uh, helping them understand all of the signals that are being gathered and what they can do with those. Um, and then, you know, like I've done here, uh, just talk about uh, the format, just address the format rather than saying, well, this is how TV works and this is how YouTube works. Um, because the reality is we're starting to buy TV programmatically. Um, so it's really not an either or. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. I think that'll help uh, hopefully anybody else who's interested in creating kind of a digital first program. Um, but yeah, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, but yeah, thank you, Beth. Um, we're, these updates are fantastic and we're so excited for everyone to be able to get into them and um, review them for your course as well as just be able to check out the simulation. So you can go and click on that pop-up and get free instructor access to both Beth's Media Planning Essentials courseware and the Mimic Media Planning Simulation. And yeah, we're excited to see those who can uh, figure out what works for them, but awesome. Thanks, Beth. Well, um, we'll move on to our next speaker now. But Thank you all. Bye. Thanks. Awesome. So next up, we have uh, Dana Boren. Um, so we'll welcome Dana. Dana is an assistant professor of media studies at Northeastern State University with a focus on advertising and marketing. Prior to teaching, Dana was in marketing at NSU for eight years and owned a screen printing company for seven years prior to that. Dana has a bachelor's in marketing, an MBA, and has completed a, the coursework for a doctorate. We're excited to have Dana today, and just a reminder to keep using the chat and put any questions throughout, and uh, I'll follow up later with Dana for a QA. and a um, But we'll turn the time over to Dana. So Thanks, guys. Um, awesome. So I want to just preface this before I get started with, uh, I'm assuming, wait, let's, let's share the screen. <laughs> Let's act like we've done this before. Okay, sorry. Okay, I just want to preface this before I get started. I'm assuming that everybody, I see the screen. <laughs> uh, I work at a regional university, so it's a little smaller. So we don't always have access and we teach one media planning and management course in the entire university. Um, so I have to be really um, strategic with resources. We don't have a lot of resources available through the library. Library, We certainly don't have access to comms point or any of those. So today, really what I wanna focus on is just a little lesson that I do in the classroom. Um, typically I teach this face-to-face. -face. I will say that I am adopting the um, bundle for media planning essentials for this fall and already working on it. So uh, just wanted to preface that as we go forward. So we'll look at streaming or traditional versus streaming radio. Just a little um, little quote I found from Edison Research that really is just kind of verifying for the students that radio is really still um, a viable tool to reach our audiences. So I, I do want to throw a poll out there real quick. Um, I start the class with this. How do you all listen to music? Uh, so I often hear from the students, as you all probably do when they come in, that 
traditional media is dead. Radio and newspaper are the first two that they speak to. Uh, so just kind of reaffirming to them that, yes, maybe some of that traditional uh, traditional media is is changing, uh, but there is still a need for it, especially for reaching certain segments. So I often start these classes with, it, we're gonna do a student recruitment campaign. You've been a student, we teach students, and so this is an easy way for them to kind of wrap their minds around it if they've never had a class like this before. So I start with, what does that traditional college student look like? Could you describe them for me? Um, and then kind of give them some hints on what that might look like. Uh, and then also, who else influenced your decision about college? And so often this is, you know, the parents, counselors, mentors comes back. So I start this by just identifying your primary and secondary audiences and really just kind of try to pull the information that I just asked for on the previous screen out of them. Um, and then here is, this is actually one that we did in a class uh, just not very long ago. So this is kind of what would come out from the students, right? And so for us, we have a lot of first generation college students. We also have um, one of the largest population of Native American students. So those may be unique for, for this college, but really what we're gonna focus on here is that secondary audience, that kind of 40 plus is how they describe them, right? So they're gonna be parents, they're gonna have a college student old enough to, to be looking at colleges or a high school student, um, and then some other uh, just behaviors. So these are some buyer personas that I actually, and I'm gonna try to go out and hopefully this doesn't mess up, uh, use HubSpot for this. They have a great build my persona tool if you all have not used it. I highly recommend it. It's a fun little way for them to really start to begin to talk about audiences um, maybe more by talking about them as people instead of talking about them by all their descriptors. Uh, so this is kind of what those look like when they're finished. And so we have designed now College Going Cody and Helicopter Heidi, and we have some, you know, various information about these two. And you'll see this pop up in the assignments. And so this is just really a identifying your target audience. So as we're going through this right now, we're talking about college, um, but each student in the class would either be assigned a business or an organization, or they would have picked one. I also, because we don't have access to national data, uh, always encourage them to pick something more regional or even a local small business or a small nonprofit. Um, and then I finished with how do we reach these people? And again, this is typically a blank screen and I ask them to help fill it in. So this is typically, you know, social media is pretty easy for them. Um, I, I sometimes have to pull out the recruitment from high school events because I just think they forget. Um, and then search ads, even though they know they search, they don't necessarily recognize that they're clicking on search ads sometimes. So. Uh, but then going back to Helicopter Heidi, so this is the parent that we're talking about, and they can pretty much start to identify then how their parents or older people might be receiving that information. So this is uh, just a little media pros and cons sheet. I have a lot of students, of course, like you all do, that work in industry. And so it, occasionally after they've graduated, they'll send me something to use in class. And so this is one that they have shared with me. Um, and so I just will go over here with what is the difference, you know, what are the pros and what are the cons of radio? Really great for um, brand awareness, right? But really difficult to track, really easy to change out those 30 second ads. Um, and again, kind of this reaffirming that, you know, people are still listening to the radio. So I then move on to research for radio. Where do we get this research? And especially if we don't have access to Nielsen or to Arbitron or to any of the rating services. And so we have um, SRDS here at NSU. We have a very limited subscription to it. I mean, very limited. So I'll go out and just show you that real quick. This is, um, kind of that detailed report. So I just went in here earlier and I picked all of the radio stations that really are pulling in that higher demo, right? But we can also see what formats they're working in. They have access to them as far as sales reps, we could click in and get additional data. 
So that is one of the things that comes from SRDS, and I'll show you what else we can get from there in just a little bit. Um, so this Nielsen Opportunity Report, I actually called our marketing comm department here on campus, and they sent me a couple of pieces that we'll look at later. Um, and then I always reach out to local radio reps to see if I can get the latest four buck averages and get some of their data and stats, and then of course the pricing. Um, and most of the time they're pretty good. Now what you're gonna see in both the, the next assignment that we're gonna go over um, is really old data. I did get some yesterday, but I'm gonna be honest, I wasn't willing to go back and redo all of this. But if you're interested in the new data, I would be glad to send it out. So this is, again, this came from the SRDS. Um, and so this is really just looking at our MSAs. We have three in this area, one in the Fort Smith area. And I don't know if you can see this, but we're, I'm located right here, Tahlequah, Cherokee Nation, home of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Nation. And then this is Tulsa. This is really our closest market. And it really does most of these reach um, and cover over this area. So this is just another thing to show the students when we're talking about radio. How far are they going? Which MSA are we buying from? So this is um, a look at that Nielsen Opportunity Report. Uh, again, and just kind of going over with them, I get this is old data, but being able to show them what those quarter hour listeners look like um, and understanding that even though zero, we have the highest percentage in zero quarter hour listeners, so not great, uh, but there are enough percentages here that suggest that there are still people listening to the radio. And then again, in this um, quintile listening, our highest percentage is that fifth quintile and, and the lightest amount of listening. So this is more of that Nielsen radio data. It was getting a little convoluted, so I just threw it in its own um, table. So this is really just showing us that about 70% still listen to the Tulsa radio metro market. Um, and then 11% either on local or internet. And then this sports, because uh, we've got a couple of sports radio stations here in town or in Tulsa, and it really covers a demo from about 18 to over 60. So uh, we can get a lot of crossover there. Um, and then again, this is more Nielsen data telling us, you know, how are they listening to internet radio versus Spotify or Pandora? I would suspect just listening to the students that these have actually switched now and we're seeing more on Spotify and less on Pandora. Um, and then next I move into how do we measure radio? What, is, what does that even look like? And so I am just going to give a shout out to Beth because all the Excel spreadsheets that she provided, I um, actually made almost something similar, but I didn't put, I, I didn't connect the um, formulas in there. I wanted them to do it old school through the calculator. So you might want to use Beth's sheets to actually figure um, any assignments you might use for me. That might be easier for the students. So this is another um, report that comes from the SRDS. So this really is just looking at day parts for radio. And for this fourth quarter of last year, we should, in, in this morning drive time, we should look at paying about $55. Um, and of course, this is looking at all audiences, not just this 40 plus that we were trying to target um, and 60 second commercials. So. So of course this cost per thousand is something that we all use um, and, and everybody should be familiar with, but certainly the students aren't. So it's a great way to just kind of teach that. And then I'll just take you out to, I found this little cost calculator online. And so I just put in here another slide that we're gonna see in just a minute. Um, if I paid $6,600 for 375,000 impressions, what does that cost per thousand uh, versus a traditional radio campaign, and if I paid $2,100 for it and I got 129, then I'm at $1,688. So there is actually a cost per click calculator in here, uh, tons of different calculators. So I encourage you, if you don't have access to stuff like that, it might be a great way to get your students. Uh, okay, so next, just kind of going over the cost per point and then the gross impressions. Um, the sum of all the rating points and looking at how many G GRPs are we purchasing or will we get from an ad schedule. 
And then finally, this is um, just some radio data. Again, we'll see this in a later screen. It was very difficult to read. So I just threw it in this table real quick and just really go through with the students, you know, this average quarter hour, what does it mean? It means we have 28 people on this KMY, 2800 on KMYZ actually listening. And then we're picking up some additionals that are falling outside of the demo that we were looking at, right? And then that five spots per week, our costing, what is our net reach? What is All of that good stuff. This is uh, from a old radio buy that I had done a long time ago, but I think it's a great way just to show them what this looks like. Um, and so this, and then also showing them that these will calculate all of the things that I am asking them to calculate by hand. Um, but by the end of this, we would have reached 36% reach um, at 3.8 average frequency, and we would have purchased about 138.4 GRPs, so or gross rating points. And then this is a Pandora assign or a, a Pandora buy sheet. And so essentially this really is looking at Cook, Illinois. This is another one. Again, I got this from the communications and marketing department. I am assuming they purchased this to start recruiting in Illinois. Um, but if we just kind of look across here and you'll notice that this was the 375,000 um, is the impressions that we are looking for. And then we're going to spend about 1760 in our net rate, $20 in our gross rate. And this is 6,600 is what it's going to cost us. So I'm, I'm going to stop here really quickly. So this is all assignment two. Um, and really what I have the students do is dig through all of the radio information that I get from the local radio reps. Um, we go through an example together and then I give them an assignment where they have to pick three additional radio stations, do all of the work that we just did in class, and then write a suggestion to their business as to which business or which radio stations they would suggest buying and then giving them a reason of why. And hopefully that amounts to numbers. So in this, we do a lot of numbers in media buying and planning, right? And so we don't necessarily get to do the fun stuff. And often when we're buying or planning media, we don't even know what that creative might look like, right? Or we don't have a say in that creative. So the third assignment that you're going to have access to is really a Pandora best practices sheet. And it's one that I got from Pandora years ago. I'm sure they don't even do it this way anymore. It was really when they first started. Uh, but I like to use it because it teaches the students what does it look like to write the radio commercial and then record the radio commercial. So if you all will remember, um, I don't remember if it was last year. I think it was a couple of years ago. Uh, the social dilemma came out. And we did a whole session, I'm sure you all did, on the social dilemma. And so one of the things that I had a class do was actually write and record a radio spot for the social dilemma. So I embedded a couple in here and I'm just going to have you all give a listen to it. Can you hear that? Are you listening? It's hard to focus with that distraction in your hand, so why not put it down? Visit thesocialdilemma.com to learn more about social media addiction and what you can do to prevent it. Come on back to reality. We've been waiting for you. All right. So this is really just looking at kind of that Pandora buy that we looked at earlier and then picking the traditional radio buy. Right. And just kind of comparing those two in the most basic formula of looking at the cost per thousand. So I think it really resonates with the students when they can recognize that even though they believe that everybody is listening to music the way that they are, there is still a very affordable mechanism to reach those older adults through traditional radio. Um, and this is one way to look at it. And so I'm going to play this next one. This is another commercial that was done by a student in that for the social dilemma. Edward Tooth said there are only two industries that call their customers users, illegal drugs and software. Don't be a fiend for your screen. Do you feel like a slave to your smartphone or computer? You are not alone. 
For more information on how to take back control of your screen time, please visit humanetech.com. That is H-U-M-A-N-E-T-E-C-H.com, humanetech.com. Take back control. All right, and then this is the last one, and then I'll uh, take any questions if you have any, or we can look at some of the assignments if you'd like. Do you hear that? That's the sound of your sister's gender reveal party. Sounds fun, right? What's going on? Is it a boy? Is it a girl? You'll never know. Why? Because you were watching Tiffany's gender reveal party on Facebook. Parties are more fun in real life. Look up. Log off. So that one he actually won an award for. I was really impressed. It was a whole in real life um, campaign um, really done around kind of the social dilemma. So pretty proud of that one. Um, I will say, and I tell my students this all the time, and, and maybe I've said this before in this presentation, I don't know, but um, you know, many of our students go to big agencies where they're gonna be doing national buying and they're gonna have access to proprietary software and all of the things, right? But a lot of our students go to one man tourism departments or one small agency or even just small businesses that need to buy media and they need to know how to do it the right way. So my goal in this class has not necessarily been for training media buyers on that national platform, but really just to train them well in all of the different medias so that if they happen to be in a small office where it's one or two students or one employee and a student worker, they've got the tools necessary to do some really good media buying that makes sense. And it's not just based on what they feel might be a good channel. So this is just, I, this is a look at, <laughs> at the Excel spreadsheet, I'm, I'm really embarrassed to even show this after seeing Beth's, but I'm gonna go ahead and show it, uh, where I give them the formulas, but I make them dig through all of this information. And there is much, much more than this um, in your assignment number two, I believe. So I, like I said, I did not put the formulas in there for them. I didn't make them connect within the spreadsheet, um, but they have access to be able to know how to do it. And this would be an example of one we would have done in class. And then I would ask them to do two more for the assignment and then do a write up. So I really, I think that's it for me. Unless anybody has any questions, I'm gonna exit out of here. All right, that was awesome. Thank you, Dana. I haven't seen any questions come through yet. Um, but not to discourage anybody in the chat. If you have questions, we'd love to hear from them. Um, yeah, we've got all these handouts in our right up at the top of your chat. You should be able to toggle over and download lots of these assignments. I also put in a link to Beth's worksheets um, and just want to reiterate what she said that uh, or what Beth said about making a copy and then saving them to your drive. But um, Awesome. We're, we're really excited. We loved having Dana join us. And I know that um, I took advertising classes when I was in college. And I definitely feel like there was a lot of that, like the traditional media and people thinking like traditional media was dying. <laughs> um, and I think it just kind of, um, you'll have that pushback in your classroom, just like my teachers probably did. But um, being able to teach to both traditional media and or traditional radio and streaming radio, I think is a, a great aspect to be able to introduce to your students. So awesome. Thank, Thank you, you, Dana. Um, awesome. We I'll, let, I'll say goodbye. <laughs> um, next up, we have Nancy Brinson. Um, and before I introduce Nancy, as you know, and as Beth stated, the comms point logic tool is leaving the educational space at the end of June. Um, Stu Kent has started conversations with several companies to explore industry tools for media planning to try and help educators keep up with the industry and create assignments like the ones that Nancy has created that she'll show you in her presentation. Um, so stay tuned for future updates on that. But um, awesome. Now I can introduce Nancy. Um, Nancy Branson is an assistant professor and director of the Integrated Channel Planning Sequence 
that's a lot of words, the Integrated Channel Planning Conference <laughs> at the University of Alabama. Uh, Nancy came to academia after 25 years in the in advertising industry, working in leadership positions in the media departments of DDB, Tracy Locke, Ogilvy. Her goal is to prepare students for careers in the industry by providing as much experience with the real world media planning processes and tools as possible. So with that, that sounds like you already. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? I'm guessing I'm good. My little microphone is popping up and down. So, well, I'm excited to be here with you. I, I actually think it's great. I don't know if Darlin planned this or not, but um, Dana's and my assignments really look at different aspects of what our students might need. And so I'm glad it, it coincidentally worked out that way or whether Darlin planned it. But um, I'm gonna be focusing more on the planning side of things rather than the buying. And they're both important and students need to understand them. But um, because I've come from the big national agency background and our students are expected to, to do the planning piece. Um, and we have a lot of resources in our library that provide research and that sort of thing. So um, that's kind of my focus today. So I'm going to talk about, um, now how do I forward my slides here? I don't see, oh, there it is. Okay, great. Um, so a quick agenda, I'm just talk about my background a little bit. I'm gonna talk about why I think project-based uh, learning is important, and um, then some kind of some preliminary decisions that you need to make if you're going to go that route. Um, some assignment, the, the way I structure my assignments, and then I'm gonna show you an actual assignment I did, which. Uh, and Darlin has the Word documents that are going to be available as, as uh, handouts, but I, I just have some quick screenshots and I'll quickly walk you through that and I can answer questions. So again, she mentioned my background. I had 25 years of agency experience. I haven't been in academia long. I've, this is my fifth year, so I'm an assistant professor, um, but I am very excited about not, not just my research, but, but my teaching role because I have a lot of, of uh, agency and brand experience. And um, I do head up our integrated channel planning concentration. Um, so we have about a thousand students in our ad and PR department. And of those, um, like 35% are ad. We have a lot more PR than ad here at uh, Alabama, but we're hoping to change that. Um, and then I also lead our, um, uh, on the graduate side, um, I also do, we do media strategy and analytics and we get more into the analytics side, but I'm not going to talk about any of that today. I'm just going to focus on the undergrad class. So to start with why final projects, um, I, I think for, at least for my courses, it's a very much a core teaching outcome is to be able to apply the knowledge they've learned about media planning. Um, and I think it's especially important in, in a practice focused major, like advertising and public relations, you know, we're not studying chemistry or or English, we're, we, we're teaching a, a profession and trying to make sure that our students are able to, you know, take the knowledge that we hopefully um, bring to them or hand to them, whatever, and inspire them to take on on their own and to be able to apply that in the world world. So um, the other thing I think is really important is being able to strengthen their teamwork skills. You know, we all know for, if we've worked in the industry or in any job, really, that there's it's really important in, in terms of working in your career to have strong teamwork skills so things like you know establishing ground rules about who's responsible for what and building accountability um, setting deadlines um, you know looking how to resolve conflicts and reaching consensus with people because you don't always all agree especially in in advertising um, and also communication it's really important i've seen i would say 50 percent of the problems i've seen with my student in teamwork is they don't communicate with each other. And you know that's important with your teammates as well as your client or your boss. So I try to you know, emphasize, teach them ways to be better at all those things. And the, the other thing, probably the most important outcome, and I've seen this directly impact my students' um, job seeking, is to have a professional quality looking presentation to take to their, in their portfolio to take on their interviews. And you know, especially when we have the comms point tool, it was, you know, definitely got attention from the agencies like you've used comms point, you know, but I, I believe that the simulation and hopefully we have, we're looking at another um, media planning software tool to use for those who want to do the final projects with real clients that, that we have some kind of access to something to help them uh, make that happen. Uh, so, 
Next slide. Here we go. So kind of some preliminary decisions that you're going to need to make if you decide to go this route is number one, how much to a value to assign the project. I typically make it worth 35% of their grade because again, my one of the key outcomes for us is to apply their learning. And this is a 400 level course for us. So they've had some preliminary um, courses on doing research and pulling data and, you know, math and sort of that sort of thing. So it's important that they have something that they can use when they go out in the real world. So I make it worth 35%, but I do um, break it down. I'll show this when I um, show you the practice assignment. They submit drafts in three parts of, you know, as they as they build their plan along the way. So those are each worth 5% and then 20% for the final presentation. So the idea is they're not just doing this thing in a vacuum all semester and then all of a sudden they turn in something that's terrible. I'm trying to lead them with the goal that at the end of uh, when they're finished, they'll have a nice looking project. Um, so the other thing is group versus individual. So for my master's classes, I have them do individual projects and I have them do a lot more data analysis and we have access to Sprinkler, which looks at um, online conversations and social media and that sort of thing. But I typically for undergrad classes, we have um, 30 in a class. So I usually put them in teams of two to three um but you know if that so everything i'm going to talk about is more from the group perspective but it doesn't mean you can't use the same assignment for individuals because i've done it both ways um so in, when i'm looking at groups i always do like early on in the, the second class after i've done the syllabus intro i do a student introductory exercise and not only does it help students get to know each other mm -hmm. But in terms of the final project, I want people to get to know other students in the class to be thinking in terms of who they might want to work with on the final project. Sometimes students already know each other and they know, yeah, I want to work with this person or even I don't want to work with this person. But it just gives them an opportunity to get to know people and hopefully, you know, get them excited about working with someone in particular in the class. And then once I've done that, the next class, I, have a t I do a team placement survey and I have them fill it out. And basically I ask things like, and to, I, they, I have them rank their skills, you know, are you strong at research or writing or design or presenting? And the idea is that I can match people up, you know, if you've got somebody, if I don't want to put three researchers in the same group or three uh, designers in the same group, but yeah, I can do the slides well no, but we also need somebody who knows how to interpret the research and, and make something about, I mean, they're all supposed to work on all aspects, but you want someone to just kind of lead some of those specific activities so that, you know, that, that they're putting together, they really truly are working a team and each bring strengths that make it better, which is what they do in an agency, right? Um, and then I also ask them about their schedules, because, um, you know, oh, I work, or I, and I, I got so tired of dealing with, my teammates can never find a time to meet, so I, I try to manage all that up front. And then, of course, I ask them, is there someone you want to work with or someone you'd rather not work with based on past experience? So it sounds like a lot of trouble, and it can be. I mean, I usually spend several hours on it when, putting the team together, but it has saved so much drama down the road. It's like the idea of you're putting people together that have complementary strengths who, you know, if there's someone someone doesn't work well with, you can address that up front. You can look at their schedules, all that sort of thing. So I find that it's worth the time to, um, to go through that exercise and make that work. And then um, the next thing, obviously, you need, well, I do this typically before the semester starts, is identify a client. So you may want to work with a local client. I typically do national, and that was because Comps Point was just, you know, worked really well with national media planning. So I typically pick a national client and I mostly work with national clients, but you wouldn't have to. Um, and I often will pick a client that I maybe have a connection with somehow through a friend that works for their agency or I know someone there. Um, but if not, uh, just uh, what I would recommend is pick a business, a national brand that has a unique problem or opportunity at the time. And the pandemic presented a lot of those because two of my past clients have been Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, which is the example I'm going to show you here in a second, which obviously they took a beating during the pandemic when they literally couldn't cruise for two years. And another client I chose was Peloton, who had the opposite. They took off during the pandemic, but then coming out of the pandemic, you know, they've really seen a loss in revenue and they're losing uh, a lot of their subscribers. So, you know, those are examples of clients that make sense. So there's a unique problem or something that the students can get excited about. Um, and the other thing I do, obviously, with the group exercise is to do a peer review. And I usually make it worth five to 10 percent of their grade. And I think that the threat of knowing that your peers are going to 
be evaluating your contribution to the plan. Um, definitely motivate some students who maybe would not prioritize, because we all know those students are out there, right? There's students who believe that, you know, oh, it's a team project and so-and-so over there is really into doing all the work and they're the A plus students. So I'm gonna let them do the work and I'm just gonna coast and I'm trying to discourage that. And I check in with them when they submit their parts one, two, and three to evaluate how the team structure is going. And I also allow students, if they come to me, it happens once in a while, they'll just say, I'd rather do the project on my own and I allow them to do that too. But I don't let them fire a teammate, but if so, I tell them, not only are you gonna be reviewed by your peers and like, you know, 10% of your grade is gonna be determined by that, but if anyone who scores less than 50% on the peer review only gets 50% credit on the plan. So that's in my syllabus. I remind them constantly and that seems to, I mean, I still have like one student every semester who doesn't do their part of the work, but for the most part, the, having that peer review play in place really helps to keep students motivated. So in terms of the assignment structure, I mentioned that, you know, I, I break it into three parts, but there's some other things I do too. So the first thing I do is I write a client brief and it's structured on I'm gonna show you an example here in a second, but it's structured on what you would do in an ad agency, the preliminary information, the background on the client, what their challenges are, what their goals are, objectives, things like that. Um, and I try to make it fun. So I will show the brand's current commercials if they have them, and I'll, we'll visit their website, and we'll look at their social media pages, you know, what people are saying about them, how many followers do they have, stuff like that. Um, I One semester I did the Built Bar, which is a um, health, healthy energy bar and I brought in uh, the bars and did tastes of them and let the students taste them obviously before the pandemic but th the idea is that you're trying to build and create enthusiasm for this project so that they feel kind of attached and connected to the brand then I um, fo follow up with the students about a week after the brief ask them to report back to me you know who's going to be uh, responsible for what aspects so again building that accountability knowing that okay you've submitted this so when you turn these aspects, these parts of your plan, and I'm going to be looking at, okay, who did this, who did that, and reminding them, you know, along the way that they need to step up their um, efforts if they were falling behind or whatever it might be, or if they need help, I help them. Then part one is the heavy, the heavy research component. So everyone works on that. It takes a lot. It's probably the most time consuming, but they go out and they, um, you know, pull data, secondary data for my graduate students. So they look at Simmons and they look at ad spender and we have a tool called simply analytics that looks at where audiences are ge geographically so depending on what things you have available you can um, customize that to be to fit what your situation is and but i the main thing is they're also supposed to interpret that it's not just a big data dump oh and they also give some thought to who they think the tar target audience should be and build personas so then they turn that in I review it, it's it's only worth 5% of the grade, so it's no harm, no foul if they're completely off base, but I have a chance to correct any misinformation because obviously this research forms the foundation of their media planning. So I wanna make sure that they're on target with that. Then part two is when they get into the software. Now when we had comms point, you know, that was, you had to code the audience and do all these things. Um, I know that we're, and I think Darwin's gonna talk about this, that we're looking at uh, another software vendor that I'm familiar with uh, that does something similar, not to the degree of comms point, but it's still a good tool. And it would enable them to, you know, knowing who their audience is, they can build a preliminary plan or two. The idea is I want them to do some draft kind of plans and then present it to me and tell me, you know, based on these, we think this would be our best solution. I can give them again, give feedback. They can resubmit part one if they want to, um, with the idea of continually bettering the final project, the final product. And then part three, was, is where they actually finalize. This is the plan we've chosen. They build a flow chart. They write the rationale for their different channels. And, oh my goodness, I forgot to forward my slide. I'm so sorry. There we go. <laughs> You're like, what is she talking about? Um, <laughs> and then um, then the, and then they uh, suggest some ex executional ideas. So if you're going to do um, online banner ads what are some of the websites if you're going to do paid search what are some of your keywords you know that kind of thing if you're going to do uh, online video what are some sites or programs that you would tap into so that gives them a chance and again they get feedback on that and then their final presentation which is worth 20 percent of the grade is they i have them record it but they also put together a powerpoint deck and it's something that they can print out and laminate and make it look really nice so that they can present it 
to a client. It has screenshots from the software. I mean, it, it definitely comes together looking um, like a really polished plan. So, um, so I mentioned I have a case study I'm going to share with you. Um, and it was for Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. It was a client that we did, um, I did uh, about a year ago, actually. So, uh, so I apologize, these are just Word doc, but these documents are in your handout. So you can download this and use them as a template if you want to. But I start with, you know, kind of trying to motivate them just like you would a real client brief. You know, you've been challenged by a marketing team to help them increase their booking. So it goes into the background of the company. Um, it, you know, and, and, and so if you don't have this information from a client, it, it I sometimes do these and it just it takes me a couple hours on a weekend and I'll just go in and research the brand. You, know, you can go on their website and get most of the information, but I'll talk about, you know, when they when they started, you know, who the key players are, if that makes a difference. Um, in the case of Royal Caribbean, they have 26 ships with 90,000 berths, all this kind of thing. Again, all, always available from their website. And then I get into the four P's, which comes straight out of uh, the textbook, you know, taking the marketing and the media mix, trying to apply because, you know, typically when you're in an agency environment, you're working with the, with the marketing team at a brand and they look at the four P's. And although we can only affect one P, the promotional P, we still have to understand what the client's goals are and how to convert that into uh, objectives for, the, for your media plan. So we talk about their product. Again, I've got the, um, their website link on there. I talk about the price, what they're, they're in the premium price. Again, I found all this on, you know, really simple online searches. To, it does not take a lot of effort to do, um, but who their key competitors are. Um, and then I go into um, that the fact that they compete with land-based vacation providers too. So again, just trying to give them a story, a case study of, the, of what the brand is that they're working with. In terms of place, you know, where are they doing business? Where are their clients coming from? Um, and then I, I have, uh, I found a link that showed what destinations they visit. And then in terms of their promotion at the time, uh, J. Walter Thompson was their ad agency. I think they've already changed since then because, you know, it's the pandemic, but, um, it talked about what their, uh, strategies were. And so I show, you know, I kind of give them a little bit of history of what they're advertising with. Again, found this online, not difficult to get. Um, and I talk about some of their um, pricing promotions. They have the wow sale, 60% um, off the second guest, things like that. And then again, I and then I have a copy of the, a link to their commercials, which are just on iSpot TV, not hard to find. And then I get into the target audience. So I'm telling them who the client thinks their target audience is, but I always emphasize that you know, like for example, Royal Caribbean. The if you pull the Simmons on Royal Caribbean, most of their client, most of their customers are 55 plus adults because that's who does most of the of the cruising in the world. But obviously, that's changed with the pandemic. There are people who are older are a lot more concerned about, you know, COVID uh, exposure and that sort of thing. So in this case, I said that they're looking at maybe going a little younger, 35, 49 with children. And then, but they're not overlooking the seniors because that's been a sizable part of their business in the past. But the idea is, um, you know, trying to get them to think, but I'm not giving them the answer. I'm not saying this is the target audience. I'm saying this is who they targeted, but, they, but the client wants you to do the research on your end to see if maybe there's an opportunity for them to look at a new audience. Um, and then I mentioned in this case, a secondary audience is travel agents because we know that they do a lot of the bookings. So, you know, we probably need some media that's going to talk to them as well. And then I get into, this is the, that first part's a little bit more demographic in nature, you know, talking about the age and income, things like that. But then I get into the motivations, more of the psychographics, like who is the person we want to talk to because we have data for that too. And talk about, you know, um, who their target segments are, you know, is it it's families looking for adventure or memorable experiences. Um, but so the question, though, with the given the COVID-19 pandemic is who will be most willing to take a cruise in 2022? So we, uh, I, I, so I tell them flat out, the client's interested in your research and insights about the psychographics of their likely consumers in the coming year, as well as how and where they can best communicate with the audiences about their new safety protocols. So, you know, again, putting it back on them that um, it's that, that they are the client is looking for you. And I find they often will come back with different target audiences. And as long as they've rationalized it with some research and some thinking and insights, 
then I'm fine with it. There's no right or wrong answer. And then, um, so I, I reiterate the business challenge. Again, this is based on the, the, the um, Media Planning Essentials textbook. So I talk about what the business challenge is, is specifically for World Caribbean, um, their ob business objectives, their marketing objectives, their communication objectives, and then I give them a budget for a certain amount of time. So again, this comes right out of the book. And I, when I talk, when we do all the lectures about how communication objectives help you to meet marketing business, but they're, they're separate things. So they, and at this point, they've already had that lecture, so they understand um, what the goal is. Um, then, so I, I mentioned again, so part one is the research on the market share. And I, I do a, a, a assignment sheet, but I didn't put it in here because I with, didn't want to overwhelm you with documents. But I do have them, um, you know, they submit part one. So it's research on the market share, the competitive analysis, the share of voice, you know, who's spending what and what channels, who the target audience is. So they're getting into Simmons and that sort of thing. Heavy, heavy research, probably the most labor intensive part, but it's really important. You can't start to build your plan until you've answered those questions. Then part two is that building those preliminary plan options using the software. You know, here's one way we could go, here's another way. And that's where they're gonna spend a lot more time understanding the channels and learning the software. And hopefully they will have done the simulation so that they have a, a greater understanding of how, you know, to interact with different things and different target personas. And then part three is where they finalize the plan, build their flow chart, write the rationale and suggest execution ideas. So they've submitted each of these parts. I've given them feedback so that when they do their final presentation, they've had feedback on every step. So there's no reason everyone shouldn't get an A and could walk away with a beautiful project, which, you know, isn't that kind of what we're trying to do is not just test them, but to guide them and teach them and give them feedback along the way. So I, I find that it's, it's a great way to kind of end the semester that it, not everyone gets an A, but most of them do because they've already had everything um, vetted and gotten feedback along the way. Um, and then, so then I have a separate assignment for the final presentation. And I literally, I, you know, I tell them it's how many points it's worth, how much time they have, and I break down specifically um, what, how the how presentation should be structured. And it's a very detailed rubric of what they need to do and how much time they should spend and how many points it's worth. So, and I, I emphasize the point that they did a lot of work in parts one, two, and three, and more than they really need for the presentation. So they're, at this point, they're trying to distill it down and pull out the most important points to include in their presentation. So they've got an introduction, um, you know, introduce themselves, go through the, the objectives and, and the problem opportunity and challenges, and then they get into the situation analysis, which is all the research and background they did, their SWOT, their competitive analysis, and that sort of thing. And then they get into who, who's the target audience. Um, I emphasize that it shouldn't just be something demographic. There should be, you know, their attitudes and lifestyles, some behavioral things. Um, we have the Simply Analytics tool, so they can, they can map, like once they decide who they think is the target audience, we could pull a map of where they are, so that helps them decide um, priorities for geographic. And then um, I have them develop at least two target personas to show diversity within the audience and make it kind of a real person that they would actually be talking to. And then I have them do a consumer decision journey, which is also covered in the textbook uh, for each of the personas so that they uh, understand what, what that's about and how you know we're showing them from the trigger through all the way through loyalty and advocacy what media channels they're intersecting with along the path, which hopefully builds the foundation and builds more rationale for their actual channel selection. Uh, then the actual media plan, um, you know, I have them show that, and then they provide, you know, a slide for each one. What budget did you spend? How many GRPs or impressions did you deliver? What's your, why did you choose a channel? Why, what, what's it contributing to the plan? And um, then I t have them to also talk about executional ideas. So they have a lot of fun there coming up with how they would do certain things. Um, then they summarize their overall delivery and budgets and then do the flow chart to reflect the timing. Um, and then of, of course a measurement plan because you can't have a media plan without being held accountable by the client especially. So, and obviously these, the measurement has to tie back to the goals that they established at the outset. Uh, and then of course there's a uh, conclusion, and I don't really grade them on the presentation as much as the content, how they present, but I do, you know, if they don't introduce themselves or we don't wrap it up on my docs, you know, five points, but 
the idea is to really focus on the content more than how they present. And I always emphasize that there are no right answers in terms of your strategy and your channel mix. You just need to justify your choices, show some kind of research that suggests that you're on the right track. Um, but I also, it's kind of the art side, you know, we talk about the art and science of media is, is that they should feel free to be creative and have some fun with it. So that is it. And I, I don't know, let me look at the chat here. Are you asking me? Um, I don't see any questions for me, but are there any questions? Um, what software do we use? Well, that is still, I'll let, that's a great segue <laughs> to, Tarlin, <laughs> to talk about. Um, that hasn't been decided yet. Yeah, so, so um, Nancy was one of our users that used okay. comms point. And so a lot of these um, assignments that she's built, she's kind of built um, around having one of those tools in the classroom. And we know that that's something that maybe quite a few of you have also done for your courses. And so um, Stu Kent is can, continuing having conversations with industry media planning tools where we can try to find a partnership there um, to fit some of these needs and build out some of these assignments. So the answer to which software um, will have you stay tuned because we're still having those conversations. Um, and so we'll hopefully have a better answer in the future. Um, but yeah, um, I haven't seen any other questions come through. Um, if you have any, feel free. Um, yeah, awesome. So it's good to see some interest in other tools. Um, but also check out the um, sample project brief and the rubric that I put in the handouts. Um, Nancy did a great job on those. So let's see for the, we have another question on what are the planning tools for programmatic and digital OOH? So, um, yeah, so that's, and, and so that I actually have been talking directly about what optional tools and trying to guide some conversations there. And there are a ton of tools out there that agencies are using besides comms point. So, um, and most of them, and they include every single channel. I don't know about programmatic. We talked about that, darling. I don't think, and I don't think the simulation has programmatic, but, um, there are, um, the, 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 the idea is that this new software tool, and there are two or three that are heavily used by agencies, and we've been in contact with them and trying to get pricing for educational, but they, they incorporate all of the channels. So um, the answer is, yeah, we don't know what the plan, but um, specifically, Peg, I don't know if you want to contact me directly. I can tell you more about the ones that we're looking at, but I don't want to say in front of the group because I don't know how it's going to end up. I don't want to establish some sort of yeah, we're going that way when, when we can't work it out. So, but there are uh, two or three software tools out there being used by agencies that incorporate. Um, for, now I'm talking about planning. So uh, programmatic is more for buying, uh, but, but the idea is that you can do planning knowing that you're gonna use programmatic for your placements and, and it will provide, um, you know, realistic uh, CPMs and uh, cost per clicks on that, so. Did I answer your question? <laughs> I'm hedging a little bit because we're still trying to get this figured out. Yeah, but. it's a little bit of, we'll dance around it for a little bit, but like Nancy mentioned, she has mm -hmm. uh, her email still up on the screen too. So feel free to reach out to her. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we'll keep going. But, um, oh, they do. Okay, great. Thank you. Awesome. Beth. So um, oh, thank you, Nancy. Um, and thank you. So everyone who spoke today and to all of you who've joined us feel free to share these resources i've gotten today with your colleagues i'm sure they'll benefit from them as well um as a reminder we um you can get free instructor access to all of the updates to media planning essentials as well as the simulation for mimic media planning um to save you time or if you've already created a course for this upcoming semester, you can schedule a time with your dedicated course consultant to get a personal walkthrough of the courseware and the simulation by clicking on this pop-up. Um, yeah, we've got, we'll be sending out the recording today along with all of these awesome assignments and resources. Um, we're really excited for everything that's coming down the way for media planning and any future updates we have, but um, it's been a great event today and Lastly, we're going to have um, just one more push. We have this great event and we just want everyone there um, for ProfCon. Beth will be speaking there as well. 
Um, so you can come hear from her as well as many other amazing educators at this really value-packed event. It's free too, so um, we're excited. We'll also have lots to share about upcoming StuCamp products at this event and hopefully have an exciting announcement for ProfCon 2023. So we'll hope to see you there and have a great rest of your day, guys.